You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to The Art of Change with your host, Pamela Thompson. Pamela will provide you with the tools to navigate you through any change, personal or professional. Pamela will also be interviewing inspiring women leaders and change makers from around the globe. So now, please welcome the host of The Art of Change, Pamela Thompson. This is The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and we're broadcasting live today from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Are you interested in learning the key ingredients for becoming a successful social entrepreneur? Would you like to learn from an award-winning serial social entrepreneur known for her commitment to progressive business practices and gender equality? Today's show is called Lessons from a, a Serial Social Entrepreneur. I'm excited to share that Madeline Shaw is my guest on today's show. Madeline is a social entrepreneur based in Vancouver, British Columbia. She's the co-founder of Lunapads, a founding Canadian B Corp and sustainable personal care products manufacturer and e-retailer. In 2014, she founded G-Day, a national event series for girls that celebrates their transition between childhood and adolescence. Since 2016, she's been developing the business case for Nest Works, a family-friendly shared workspace that she hopes to open in 2020. Madeline is a graduate of Queen's University, the British Columbia Institute of Technology, and Think School of Creative Entrepreneurship. She blogs about her adventures in social entrepreneurship at Luna Gals. Madeline is the recipient of numerous awards for a progressive approach to business and serves as a mentor and advisory board member of Groundswell Economic Alternatives, a local social social venture incubator. Welcome, Madeline. I'm so excited to be here, Pam. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show. Well, I'm excited to have you here, and I'm excited to hear more about your journey and learn lots about what you're up to now. So, Madeline, let's dive in. What is your mission, and how did you come to that? Well, thank you. I love that question so much, and I, it's funny because you'd think it would be the kind of thing that would just kind of roll off your tongue, and, but I find like it's always, it's always evolving, and it's such a profound, profound question that I ask myself, I would say, almost every day. So I, loosely speaking, I would say it pertains to uh, a creative approach to realizing the goals of the feminist revolution. So I'm really all about uh, gender-based equality and social equality based on that framework and achieving that in interesting ways. Like I'm interested in kind of the conflation between foreign nonprofit practices to um building organizations. And I also created a mini mission statement for myself many, many years ago uh, that is simply to lead and to create. Love it. And I, that's really interesting that you think about a mission every day. I, I think more people should do that. It's uh, because it, it really, some people call it a purpose, some people call it a mission. It's, it's really something that's meant to guide us. And it sounds like to lead and to create has really has been at the heart of everything that you've done as far as I'm aware anyway. So, to, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to, to start off and tell us about Lunapads. And I was astounded when I looked on the web and found that you actually co-founded mm-hmm that business in 1993. So tell us a bit about that. What is it? Who does it serve? What prompted you to start it? Absolutely. So I started developing uh, the products. Um, so Lunapads, just to take it way back for folks listening uh, for the first time, Lunapads are washable menstrual pads. So instead of your traditional disposable ones that, that you just use once and throw away, um, uh, 
I decided to start experimenting with making washable menstrual pads and also period underwear that could be washed and reused um, multiple, multiple times instead of being thrown away. And the reason why I did that is because I was just having some health and environmental concerns. I was getting rashes and various um, kind of uncomfortable reactions to the products I was using. I was 25 years old, so I was in full flight as a menstruator at that age. And um, But doing it, developing the products, I mean, I love making things. I love sewing and I love growing things. And so making the products um, was kind of a practical solution for a need that I had as a user. But what happened when I um, switched from using tampons in my case um, to washing my own cloth menstrual pads and, and making these period underwear and washing those is it really changed my perspective about my period really, really profoundly. And when that happened, it was kind of like an epiphany, and I realized that it was something that I wanted to share with other people. I wanted them to have this incredible feeling and kind of, a, of excitement and liberation um, that changing to the products gave me, and I realized that in order to do that, I was going to need to commercialize them and start a company in order to sell them so that more people could use them, and then they would have that feeling as well. So that was sort of the, the earliest um, experience, because prior to that, I'd never thought that I would be an entrepreneur. Interesting. So <clears throat> who would you say then it serves? It, it sounds like you're, this, the Luna Pants really serve any uh, woman who's during the menstrual cycle. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, for sure. And, and I would actually broaden that because, you know, these days we think about menstruation from almost a gender-free perspective and acknowledge that not everybody who identifies as a woman menstruates and not everybody, like it's it's more of a phenomenon uh, less attached to gender than just what happens in your body, however you kind of identify that way. So that's been a really big, actually, that would be a great thing to jump into just a little bit as someone who originally, you know, I do identify as a cisgendered woman and thought about menstruation as something that only girls and women did for a really long time. But what we've seen at Lunapads in the last few years um, is just our whole definition of gender has changed so wonderfully and radically to be this kind of concept of a spectrum. So we're seeing a lot of voices of, of people who, you know, are from a non-binary approach um, or a transgender approach who still menstruate and who, you know, really deserve to be respected and have their bodies included in this conversation. But this whole traditional feminine stereotype doesn't really work for them. So it's it's actually been one of my favorite things that has happened to me in, in the last few years is really opening up to this new kind of perspective. So yes, absolutely, we do serve, you know, people who identify as women who menstruate and you know, are, are comfortable in that gender identity, but we also serve a whole bunch of other people who are not. And kind of getting to that place um, has been a really, I would say, one of the highlights of my career, in fact. Thanks for sharing that. I think that is just so timely, really. And a lot of times we don't address those issues. So thank you for that. So when you, since you've launched Lunapads, and it's a number of years, what key challenges have you faced? Well, it, I'd say the key one was almost, you know, given that I did start developing the products in the early 90s, is that the concept of reusable menstrual products was was kind of far out, honestly, at the time. It's something that's become very, very well accepted or far better accepted in the last few years. But honestly, I was I was pretty far ahead of my time. Like I sort of made this discovery and spent the first 20 years of my career, you know, trying to convince people to try it and try and change uh, a mindset that was very, very um, geared towards uh, a disposable kind of mindset or one that was even a bit fear-based around menstruation or fear-based around touching menzies or the uh, just that idea of engaging with it in that way rather than throwing it in the garbage. And so it was super challenging, like just literally trying to change people's minds around something that is so um, formidably um, embedded in their consciousness. So, you know, when people think about something in a certain way and it's the way that their their parents taught them how to use the products and what the right products were and so on, it's been very, it was very difficult for the first 20 years to kind of encourage people to change themselves and change their own mindsets. Thank you for that. And we're about to cut to a commercial break. And after the break, Madeline will be speaking more about some ch key challenges she's faced since launching Luna Pads and also some key lessons that she's learned along the way. So stay tuned 
to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and we're broadcasting from BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations, Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Uvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoub.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and my guest today is Madeline Shaw. She is a serial social entrepreneur, and before the break, we were talking about her first big business that she launched way back in 1993 called Luna Pads. And just before the break, she was sharing one of the key challenges that she had faced since launching the Luna Pads, and that was being was changing people's mindsets and perspectives related to menstruation and their bodies. Because before, it was like all about throwing out the product, but these are wash and wear products that you can use again and again. So very strong sustainability approach, but also a different way of thinking about your body and dealing with your body. So any other key challenges that you faced? What I should say is, how did you get over that? Do you think, like you said, it was a challenge, but what, you know, how did you, how did you move forward and get people to change their mindsets around that? Yeah, um, well, I'd say lead by example, right? Like, I mean, the thing, the thing is that people, once they do try it, they really, really, really do love it. And there's this incredible sense of, of liberation and kind of, um, yeah, liberation is probably the best word that I can place. Like something that you've had to do or you felt you've had to do the whole, your whole life. You know, you walk down that aisle of pink plastic in the drugstore and you pick the one that whatever seems to sort of work. And like nobody loves that, right? Like nobody loves that experience. Nobody's like, oh, yay, my favorite pair of tampons. <laughs> this makes me feel so good. And oh, yay, now I get to throw them away. Um, there's like, there's no joy in it. There's no love in it. And I think that, um, switching to reusable products that are coming from a place of, of love and respect and intention for the user, like these products have been made here in Vancouver by, we're a team of 13 women and we, and non-binary people, I should add to, and who are deeply, deeply, deeply committed to, menstruators having better experiences of their bodies and loving themselves more and feeling more knowledgeable about their cycles, which are amazing. So it, there's this really, there have always been enough people who've kind of got that and to carry us along and the business has grown and grown and grown over the years. But I, it wasn't like, I often say, oh, I should have started out by selling chocolate or something, you know, where it's <laughs> like this thing that, you know, everybody knows what it is. Most people like it. You know, it's kind of a crowd pleaser. And whereas selling reusable menstrual products um, did present this challenge. But what I love about it is that it really uh, allowed us to have and continues to allow us to have very intimate conversations with people about their bodies and their lives and their fears. And 
it just busts through so so many taboos and so many kind of mythology around even the construction of of what it means to be clean and and a proper sort of woman or whatever like we are in a position to change that in a a really visceral way that um that makes people feel fantastic very interesting did you is there another key challenge that you can think of that um you faced since launching Luna Pads well, yeah, I mean, I was not a business person. So let's start with that. So, you know, <laughs> I came from a background as a social change leader. So for me, as a social entrepreneur, I really started with the social part, not the entrepreneur part. And I didn't have any formal business training um, I, in fact, if you had asked me uh, earlier in my life if I thought I would ever become a business person or become an entrepreneur, I don't think I would have even, like, it never would have occurred to me. Like, I think I had an idea in my mind that um, being a business person was actually something bad and particularly bad as someone who wanted to create change in the world. So I, I, I felt like the, the two things were at, at odds with each other. Like, I couldn't be a feminist and an environmentalist and a business person um, because I had some funny constructs in my head that business um, was an inherently exploitative practice and that if you were selling something, then it was bad and you were taking people's money and, and whatever. Like, I don't know why I thought that, but I did think that. I believed that for a long time. And so for me to even change my identity and go, I am a business person, I am an entrepreneur, and to acquire the skills to do that (laughs) um, was a massive journey. Like it was just, it was an incredible challenge to me that kind of went against some, some beliefs that I had uh, that weren't helping me and weren't serving me. And so I kind of needed to unpack all of that. And then I needed to learn the skills of business and uh, while, you know, selling a kind of a socially challenging product. Yeah, I, I, you're you're not the first person to to say that. I think it's really interesting that a number of social entrepreneurs come to entrepreneurship through. I, I don't know whether it's the back door or the front door <laughs> of being a social activist or a social change maker, a social change agent, whatever you want to say. They didn't initially think about starting off as an entrepreneur, and I think. I think it's really exciting that we're in this place now where we're talking about social entrepreneurship and people, you know, lead with a value of making a positive difference in the world, right? And and they're very clear on their core values and they build a business around that rather than coming from a mindset of, oh, I, I want to do something to make money. What could I do, right? So I, it's like we've almost turned things on their heads, if you will, and, and coming from that place of, of purpose and mission and making a positive difference, which I think is awesome. So um, any other challenges you'd like to share related to Luna Pads and, the, and since you've la- launched it? Oh, my goodness. I mean, just the, just life. Like, I mean, I, I guess I would want anybody to know that, like, running, like, whether it's for-profit or it's non-profit or you're, whatever you're doing, like, there's there are so many challenges, and it's kind of like a process of, of meeting challenges. Like, I think there's this funny idea or mythology out there about entrepreneurship that, you it's um you're kind of living the dream and you you have this idea and then you get some sales and you get traction and then you figure it out and then you go to the next level and there's all these kind of jargony language um things around it but um to me the process is it's never ending you could call them problems if you want or challenges i guess but for me it's like it, you're it's creative right it's like you you have a garden you always have to keep weeding your garden <laughs> <laughs> if you want it to grow properly. And so if you don't like weeding, then don't do it. But um, there will always be weeds, if you will. Like there will always be challenges that, that come up, whether it's cash flow or HR or production stuff or whatever. Like I could tell you even half a dozen challenges that we're facing even today at Lunapads, um, including some personal, you know, things like, I don't know, it, it, but you you love it. it. We love it. We're here because we believe in it. And it's not because it's any different from anything else. Like I think whatever enterprise you're in to, to take on this kind of a challenge is there will always be things that you need to solve. It's never perfect. It's just like life. It's kind of a metaphor that way. 
Yeah, I I totally am with you on the businesses I've had for since the early 90s. And I love your metaphor of the garden and weeding. You definitely need to weed and you have to know also when it's time to close down the garden and move on to another one, (laughs) planting another one. So we're about to move to the commercial break. When we come back, I'll be talking with Madeleine more about some key lessons she's learned along the way of becoming a social entrepreneur and some key ingredients for what she would say are important to be successful doing this business. Pam Thompson, Art of Change. Stay tuned. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside, you know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and with me today is Madeline Shaw. She's a serial social entrepreneur, has uh, started her first social uh, social enterprise in 1993, so she's a trailblazer in this area. And before the break, we were talking about some challenges she faced in launching Luna Pads, which she's had as a business since 1993. It's a, she's a, it's an e-retail opportunity for people to buy menstrual products that are very sustainable and reusable. So now what I'd like to do is for Madeline to tell us a bit about her entrepreneurial journey. So Madeline, tell us a bit about your entrepreneurial journey, because I know you've had you've done a few things along the way. So just briefly tell us a little bit and then I'll probe a bit deeper. Sure. Yeah, no, I'd love to. Um, So I would say that for me, it actually started with the social change stuff, as I mentioned earlier. So that started for me as a university student when I became, uh, came to consciousness as a feminist and started learning about leadership and uh, took on some uh, positions in the student government uh, along sort of gender equity committees and that kind of stuff. So I, I never really led anything before and or taken responsibility, but I just felt so strongly called and so strongly motivated by um, the politics and, and just to have my passion for the issues that I kind of got my feet wet that way. So by the time I was contemplating starting my first company, and I'll tell you a bit of a story about that because it came out of a challenge. Um, I was actually fired from a job that I had, and I loved that job. I, it was, I don't know, it was quite traumatic because, you know, when you think about getting fired, you think, oh, you did something wrong or you were poor, you know, you didn't do a good job. And in this case, I was fired by uh, a young man who, with whom I'd had some conflict and kind of on a technicality. And um, there was really, at the time, there wasn't much I could do about it. And I was upset because I felt like it wasn't, it was unfair. And, um, and I went down to the beach. I live in Vancouver and I was working near the beach. And after I had the meeting with him, he told me I was being let go. I walked down to the beach and I just had this moment of very deep personal reckoning of like, the question was like, was I going to let this person 
decide what I was capable of and kind of let that define me that I was just going to be this person who was fired and, or was I going to make a different choice? And at the time I'd already been making things like crazy. I sewed all these things. I made uh, like uh, so many things from like wedding dresses to menstrual pads, as it turns out. And it was at that moment that I decided to start my first company because as sort of a statement of like, I decide who I am. I decide you know, I define myself in this way and, and not this person. And this is, and actually it was kind of, I felt sort of grateful for it because it was like, this is how, it was a way for me to find out who I really was and what I was really capable of. So that was when I first started the, the, the first business. And I would say another really pivotal time was meeting my business partner. So um, I have a, a 50-50 business partner at Luna Pads, and I didn't meet her until 1999. Um, and what I learned in between 93 and 99 was that I don't have the strongest skill set when it comes to business. And so in many ways, this lesson um, is about partnership and also about working with others. I have a, my business partner's name is Suzanne, and I met her at a leadership course in 1999. And we, she was ready to get out of her corporate job, and I needed help and was ready to grow the company and so on. And I, I think it's something that a lot of people are sort of scared of. Like there's um, this notion as entrepreneurs that we need to control everything and, and people worry about kind of giving away their company or sharing control with other people. And in my case, um, one of my biggest lessons was that you're actually far more powerful in sharing the idea with other people and uh, helping bringing a diverse skill set into what you're doing. So that was huge, and that really changed the game for, I would say, the entire trajectory of the company. And today, she's the CEO, not me, to be clear, and um, I couldn't be happier about that. Um, and from there, I guess so in 2013 – oh, sorry, you go ahead. Yeah, so it sounds like those were two pivotal change points for you when you when you got fired, and then you had to sort of decide – What's the silver lining in this change? That's one of the things when I teach about change and speak about changes, a lot of times people feel it's bad, but often it opens the door for us to, f to do something else if we flip it, right? So good on you to learn that lesson. And then the second one was to really know that, well, to meet somebody, I guess, that you got along with, but also be totally aware that it would be more powerful and it would make a lot of sense if you formed a partnership. And Absolutely. so, yeah. So in those two change points that you identified, what would you say you had to let go of? Like in the first one, what did you have to let go of, Madeline? Well, I had to let go of the idea that I was ever going to have a kind of a traditional career. Like there was really this surrender that like it just wasn't going to happen. Like, you know, my parents, I think my dad had hoped that I would be a lawyer and you know, I did go to university and so on, and, and most of my friends had what I would call more traditional jobs. And so I think it had a lot to do with identity um, and just going, okay, you know what, I'm going to do my own thing. And I don't, it doesn't, I, w I just won't be judged in the same way. <laughs> like, you know, I can't walk into a room or meet somebody at a party and say, I'm a financial analyst or I'm a surgeon or I'm, you know, bank teller, I'm something that most people understand what it is. And I just had to be like, okay with going, I'm, I'm a social entrepreneur, even though I wouldn't have said it back then, because there wasn't that kind of language. But um, I am taking my future in my own hands and doing this in a very unusual way. And I'm just going to trust that that is somehow going to work out for me. So I certainly had to let go of that. And in the second case, it was, yeah, this notion of control because people, they, it's like we fear other people. We always think that other people are going to take something from us or I don't know what, but I'm a huge believer in trust and, uh, and in relationships. And in fact, a friend of mine, one of the smartest entrepreneurs I know called Melody Berenger always says that relationships are the true currency. And that is what you really are working with like that's the only thing that's ever going to get you any success anywhere and i i have to say i would agree with her yeah i totally get that in fact um one of my guests a few weeks ago was lisa marie platsky a leadership coach and she talked about she talks about connection being currency so connection relationships yeah for really very similar so yeah thank you for sharing that we're about to cut to a commercial break and after the break we're going to talk a little bit more about 
Madeline's entrepreneurial journey, what she had to let go of, and some lessons learned along the way. So stay tuned to The Art of Change. Pamela Thompson, broadcasting for BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Have you ever wondered why some children recover from their symptoms of autism while others never seem to get any better? After 13 years of research, Karen Thomas has recovered her own son from his symptoms of autism naturally. She now shares how she did it with you in her free webinar so that you can have the right resources and knowledge to help your child. The definition of recovery is to regain health. Karen offers this to you in four stages. Healing the gut, natural heavy metal detoxification, balancing the co-infections of autism, brain support, and repair. Register now for this free webinar to help you know what you can do to help your child to sleep better, be more calm, improve focus, and reach their fullest potential to live a happy, healthy life. Go to naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash free workshop empowering parents with the resources to naturally recover autism from a mom who's done it are you looking for employment and live in los angeles orange riverside and san bernardino counties jobs annex is the place for you are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in los angeles orange riverside and san bernardino counties jobs annex is for you employers jobsannex.com is your resource for career-minded people jobsannex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at jobsannex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. Jobsannex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and my guest today is Madeline Shaw, and we're talking about lessons learned from her social, her experience as a serial social entrepreneur. And before the break, Madeline was sharing with us a bit about her entrepreneurial journey and talked about a couple of key change points along the way and what she had to let go of. And one of them was when she was fired many years ago, and she had to come to grips with that and really let go of the idea of having a traditional job and then move into creating her own business. And secondly, just realizing about six years later that she wasn't that strong in business. And when she met another woman, she created a partnership with that woman. And that woman is now, Suzanne is now CEO. And so they've been together for a number of years since 1999 and have a very strong and trusting relationship. So Madeline, do you want to share with us a third key change point or decision point along your entrepreneurial journey and what you had to let go of? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, so <laughs> having become an entrepreneur and had this idea and, you know, build a business and so on, I had this idea that I was, that was all I would ever do. Like that was, I was kind of a one trick pony and, and, you know, we hear about serial entrepreneurs, but uh, the joke I had with myself was that I was a monogamous entrepreneur and would sort of, you know, make jokes about that and so on. But in 2013, I had another very, very strong vision. Um, come to me uh, to start an event. Uh, well, just have one to begin with, but I, I wanted to have an event for girls that acknowledge their transition between childhood and adolescence. And that was based on this kind of dream I had as an adolescent girl myself when I recognized that, you know, my, my days as a child were ending and I was heading into this sort of realm of teenage years and body changes and all this stuff. And I was thrilled by that like I thought that was the most wonderful like I was so excited curious and happy about it and I it felt like the kind of thing where there should be a celebration and there should be some kind of recognition of that but the cultural background my cultural background didn't have anything like that Um, but the vision in me was so strong like it's almost like when I get something in my head um, it just won't leave me alone like I can't it's like I have to express it and so that was in 2013 And so I gave myself permission to change, to go, okay, I'm going to try something new here and start this event series in 2014. And so it went really well. And I realized that, in fact, I was capable of more. And there was, it was kind of like having another child. And in order to do that, 
I needed to let go of, of really leading Lunapads. And that's when, like before, Suzanne and I had this kind of co-leadership model. But once I started G-Day, I, it was like, I can't, I can't do that. Like, and so she became CEO of the company. I stayed on as creative director um, for several years until the end of 2017. Um, but at the time it was a huge decision for me and just realizing like, Oh no, I felt, I felt kind of out of control, but I also realized that my kind of creative genius, if you will, is as a visionary, like is having these ideas is seeing the opportunity. Like this is what makes me a social entrepreneur is seeing something that I think could be better or could just make the world a better place somehow. And then, acting on it and creating it and bringing it to life. So that was, that was another huge transi- transition point. And what would you say, well, you've, you've more or less said you, you had to let go of your position with Luna Pads. Anything else you had to let go of at that key change point? Well, again, this is, the, oh yeah, well, I guess the idea of identity. So um, again, this, this notion of going from being a monogamous entrepreneur to a serial entrepreneur and then I, at that point, I stepped into the nonprofit world. So until then, I'd been, you know, operating a for-profit company and playing by those rules and sort of thinking with that mentality. And then with starting the event series, um, I chose to make it a nonprofit. And then it is, uh, became a registered charity. And before that, I sort of thought there was like this mental division between for-profit and nonprofit and and uh, and just realizing that actually it didn't really matter at the end of the day, like it, the practice is the same. You still got to come up with, you know, the idea and the people and the money and the, you know, all of your business systems and everything. So, um, thinking of myself, like, I think at that point, that's where I, I, you know, stepping into the nonprofit world was another big change for me. And cause before that it had felt like there was more of a division. And now I see that it's much less so in my mind. Interesting. So letting go of that old belief that for-profit and not-for-profit are different, and really there's a lot of commonality amongst the two of them. There is. And, and yeah, and also really letting go of the idea that I needed to lead the company, like that I needed to be the one because I started it, that I needed to be the one to lead it. And it's like, no, it's actually somebody else. And so it was a, it was more power empowering and more liberating and just kind of more honest for me to to just step down from like a true leadership position in the company and have Suzanne become the CEO. Good for you. I, I, got, I must congratulate you on that because when it's something is your baby, then to, to give it over to somebody else, that takes a lot of courage, you know, really does. So Madeline, you've been a social entrepreneur since 1993. What would you say are key ingredients for becoming a successful social entrepreneur for the folks out there who are listening and might want to jump into the fl- the fore, so to speak? Yeah, um, well, for me, everything starts with vision. So it's almost like I have this um, irresistible idea it comes to me and I for me it's analogous to a pregnancy honestly it just is this thing that kind of inhabits me and I can't stop thinking about it and feeling curious and feeling drawn to it and just kind of in my mind playing with a certain kind of idea and so yeah it, that would be thing number one is this is having the vision like what do you want to change what bugs you what inspires you like what is you know how do we bring this down to earth um, take it from a feeling to an actual entity or a product or a service or something that is actionable. Um, I would say also, and this is going to sound kind of old fashioned, but uh, persistence. Um, you know, you just have to keep going and you have to be willing to keep going because you are so deeply motivated um, by the vision that you have. So, it, it, you know, I think these days people sort of look for something the quick fix and the something kind of fast and glamorous or some kind of an app, or I think it's these are the days we're living in when we want things to happen in some quick flashy sort of a way. But to me, um, persistence, and actually I'm going to reframe that. I think dedication is a nicer word because it also, it connotes, you know, you are, you're devoted to something, you're dedicated to something that you, you love and you believe in. And so I look for that. And then I also look for like really, really, um, Having bringing some skills, I think that really helps too. So no matter what that is, and maybe you're really good with relationships, that would be one I would point to for sure. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. You've got to be able to 
to tell your story in a very compelling way because you know don't if, if people out there if you think you have a great idea but you're scared to share it with people like please share it shout it from the rooftops tell everyone you know tell the people you sit with on the bus um, because that it's that passion and that that story like every single business partner every single major investor, every single kind of really, really key relationship I've had in all of these ventures has come through me just sharing this idea, sharing the story, and people just get hooked, like they're, they're just into it and they want to be part of it. And so, yeah. Thanks so much, Madeline. We're about to cut to a commercial break. Uh, I'm going to ask you to, to, after the break, complete your thoughts on, you know, some key successful ingredients for becoming a successful social entrepreneur. And then I'm going to open up the line. So stay tuned, folks, and be ready to call into 1-866-451-1451. That's 1-866-451-1451. Pamela Thompson, Art of Change. Stay tuned. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Intergenerational programming is uniting America due to the tireless efforts of Dr. Ramona Frischman. Retired from the Miami-Dade County Public School System, Dr. Frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children, young adults, and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and my guest today is Madeline Shaw. And we're talking about her experience as a serial social entrepreneur. And before the break, she was sharing some key ingredients for becoming a successful social entrepreneur for those folks of you out there who'd like to jump in. And um, the, the couple things she shared was everything starts with a vision and the importance to have a vision. And the other thing was dedication. And the other thing was passion and have a story that you can t- tell and passionately share with others so that they'll jump on board with you. Madeline, did you have any other um, ingredient that you'd like to share before we open the lines for callers? You know, I'd say I would still say those are my top ones because it, you know, relationships, whether they show up as working on a team or, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah, absolutely. Those those are good to go to start off with. Okay, great. So I understand we have a couple of people on the line. Um, for, and um, so let's take Patrice first. You have a question, Patrice? Welcome. Yes, hi. Thank you. And I apologize in advance for the noise. I'm actually at the pool with my kids. So um, I'm, uh, there's a lot of kids yelling in the background. But my question is actually about children. Um, Madeline, I'm curious as if, you know, you've talked about the difficulties and the advantages of being an entrepreneur. Um, would you recommend it for your own children? And if so, how would you encourage that? Oh, I love that question. And I mean, I would say, so I have a 14-year-old daughter and 
one of my greatest beliefs is that she should do whatever the heck she wants. And uh, I've had the very, very good fortune of being able to actually have her physically at work with her, uh, with me rather. And, um, and similarly, my business partner, Suzanne, did the same. And uh, we were able to you know, be pretty unique in that way and, and offer our children a very different perspective of what work is. Like I think a lot of kids don't, you know, adult work is not something that's really even visible to them for the most part. So um, I think especially in the case of girls, talking to them about all manner of careers is is really, 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 really important. But also for whatever it is that you do as a parent, um, uh talking to your kids about it and involving them and, and welcoming their questions and, and trying not to, like often the whole notion of work-life balance is pretty siloed. You know, we try and just leave our work at home and then come home to our kids and our families. And, and there's this idea that you're not supposed to talk about it. You're not supposed to share about it. And, and I actually really believe the opposite. And that's sort of the idea that I'm working with, with um, to explore with Nestworks. And so I think just being really um, welcoming of their questions and just making the idea of like education about work being as important as, as health and nutrition and anything else like that and, and sharing your journey with them. Does that answer your question, Patrice? <laughs> Yes, you good? that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Madeline. Well, thank you for your question. Now we'll take the second, the next caller, Sandra. Yes, hi. Um, you alluded to it a little bit. Um, you mentioned about sharing the load in your business and relationships, and I wondered how you managed multiple businesses with um, family partnerships and family life. Oh my goodness. Um, well, it's hard, honestly. Um, it's something that I happen to be struggling with quite a bit right now. And I tend to, I ha well, fortunately, I would say I have my husband and he is also self-employed. And so there's a great deal of kind of empathy, I would say, between the two of us. And we've sort of gone back and forth over the years and I guess 17 years that we've been married, um, even kind of taking turns uh, supporting each other financially, um, and uh, of course raising a daughter together, and so that's it's been challenging. I feel like you ask or I ask a lot of other people, and um, because I need them so much, like in order to do, you know, to bring these big visions to fruition and to, you know, create these things, you're asking people to take an enormous risk with you, and uh, that's something. I value, I, uh, but I don't know any other way to do it. It's 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 like there's not there's no easy way out, and um, so it's just it's taken a lot of trust and it's taken a lot of faith and it's taken a lot of blood, sweat, tears, um, honesty, transparency, uh, and even with all the good things going, um, I would say that it's it's not an easy journey. And and also, you know, I know I've seen p businesses fail. Uh, I've had my own businesses all, almost fail. Uh, you know, it just creates a huge amount of stress on on families. So it's certainly not for the pain of heart. And I would, at this point, interject as well that um, a lot of where I come from and what's enabled me to get where I have, even right out of the gate, what is due to social privilege. Honestly, you know, I. I was, my parents wanted me to go to university and so they helped me pay for it and they, you know, just all of these different things and I've had um, people co-sign loans for me and I, you know, various things like that that are really honestly attributable to the fact um, of social privilege. And so, uh, yeah, I just want to really be clear about that for people out there who maybe are working with less you know, for whatever reasons are marginalized um, or don't have access to the resources that I had access to, just to sort of think, oh, poof, you know, I'm just going to start my social enterprise and everything will be groovy. Uh, it's, it, you've got to remember that my story is, is not typical. And um, yes, it's required courage. And yes, it's required creativity. And yes, it's required leadership and all the things that I've brought to it. But um it's, it's been predicated on uh, some really favorable circumstances that were working in my favor, including a wonderful marriage to 
someone who's uh, helped me a lot and always had faith in me and helped me raise my daughter. Thank you for that. Sandra, are, are you, do you feel complete? Are you good? Yes, thank you so much. And, and for acknowledging privilege, I think that's a really important point as well. It, it totally is. And, and I appreciate that you did that because I, I feel like that's where I come from as well. And I've had businesses since the early 90s, four of them. And uh, my husband at the time was traveling to the other side of the world. So he was away at least six months a year. So it was not an easy road, but I was so passionate about what I was doing. It didn't really, you know, I, I kept at it, but I did have, I was able to pay for childcare support. And, uh, you know, so, so I believe it, that is so important to highlight that. And it is not such an easy road. However, we can do it if we're excited and passionate about it. So we're about to cut to a commercial break. And when we come back, Madeline will share with us something she's really excited about in her business right now. And we'll, I'll share a bit about what's happening next week. Stay tuned. Introducing BetterHomeAndGarden.com. That's www.betterhomeandgarden.com with just the letter N in Better Home and Garden. Betterhomeandgarden.com offers you the highest quality products on the market that are environmentally safe and effective and to make them available to you at the lowest possible prices. Betterhomeandgarden.com understands that kind of creativity and do-it-yourself attitude. Thus, we developed our website, betterhomeandgarden.com. Betterhomeandgarden.com offers you the following products right online. Bath, bedding, collectibles, craft, sewing and hobby, food and beverage, furniture, home decor, kitchen and dining, lamps and lighting, large appliances, musical instruments, outdoor cooking, patio items, pet supplies, plant and garden, rug and floor covering, small appliances, travel and luggage, and so much more. Better Home and Garden is an online retailer offering a wide variety of high-quality brand name merchandise at discount prices. Our service is personal and we aim to please. Visit us at www.betterhomeandgarden.com. Make your home your own. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and my guest today is Madeline Shaw, a serial social entrepreneur. Before the break, uh, we answered a couple of great questions from uh, the audience, so listeners. So thanks very much for calling in. We, we appreciate your, your listening and your great questions. So Madeline, what is something you're really excited about in your business right now? Well, um, I would say the thing I am, well, uh, it's so hard to choose because there's so many good things going on and I'm involved with so many different things, but um, I would say I'm really excited about Nestworks and where that has the potential to go. So for folks just, uh, we haven't talked about it much, but Nestworks is a a new way of imagining work-life balance and essentially um, it's a family-friendly shared workplace. So if you are an independent consultant or an entrepreneur or you're working a remote worker and you are a parent, uh, we are working to create a space, a work environment that is designed to meet your needs uh, as a worker but also as a parent. And so we are going to be offering a multitude of family-friendly uh, forms of different, you know, child minding and other amenities that support kind of the integration of work and life. And so, you know, normally we talk about work-life balance and the language that we use at, G- at rather Nestworks is work-life integration. How can we actually bring those together and what are the opportunities for social innovation within that kind of a container? How can we, for example, you know, teach children about work in a different way? What are the opportunities for improved mental health, um, efficiency, environmental sustainability, and a bunch of other um, benefits? And so we're hoping, hoping to open up a couple of pop-ups uh, here in Vancouver in 2020, and uh, that I am, I just can't wait to see it actually come to life. You know, it's one thing to have an idea, and it's another thing to actually see it for it to be a real thing. Um, and I'm excited about G-Day Toronto coming up on October the 19th in Toronto. And I'm excited about Lunapads is getting very close to launching a new brand in 2020. And so I feel really lucky to get to be part of that as well. So much happening. Do you ever sleep there, Madeline? <laughs> 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 so in terms of Nestworks, if, if people want to learn more about that, how do they do that? So uh, that's at nestworks.space, and Nestworks is all one word, N-E-S-T-W-O-R-K-S. And you can find us on LinkedIn, you can find us on Facebook, uh, and I believe on Instagram. And similarly, uh, G-Day is at gday.world, and online, and Lunapads is at lunapads.com. 
Thank you. That's great. And if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? I would suggest LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not very active. I'm not on Twitter at all. I'm not very active on Instagram and Facebook. I try to keep relatively personal. So, so please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear from anyone. Great. Well, I am so excited to hear when uh, about your upcoming initiatives that Nestworks. I almost wish my kids were younger and I could start this again because uh, it, there weren't as many options when my kids, I had a, I have a son and a daughter and uh, when they were growing up, you either took them out or had someone stay in your house, right? And so this is, I think, a really great opportunity for parents, but also for kids. So I, I wish you well with that. Now, did you, did you have any parting words before I share a little bit more about next week? Sure. I mean, well, I just want to, for starters, say thank you so much for this opportunity. It's really been lovely, and I've enjoyed our conversation so much. And I would say, as I, you know, I was looking over your materials and your website, and and just this notion of the art of change, and I I think what I would really like to share with people is that if you want, want to be a social entrepreneur, or even not, like, just fully live your life, like, I think reframe the notion of change as just growth. Like, it's just evolution. It's not... It's not something that we need to be, that needs to be jarring or needs to be kind of shocking. Like, it's just, it's just the natural progression of life. And we get to see more and we get to be more along that journey. Thank you for your wise words. And certainly, yes, that's why I framed it, the art of change. And it is underpinned by the belief that embracing change is a creative process that opens us up to new opportunities. So thank you so much, Madeline, for sharing so much about what you've done in your journey. A lot of powerful lessons here. And I know you've been provide a lot of wisdom. I'm thrilled to share that my guest on next week's show is Donna Morton. She is a serial social entrepreneur. And the name of the show is using technology to make values based decisions, support systems change and serve humanity. Hope you're able to join us. So till next time, remember to embrace the art of change and make a positive difference in the world. been listening to The Art of Change with host Pamela Thompson. Tune in each week as Pamela shares her experiences based on leading, coaching, and consulting across five continents. Learn firsthand about change, leadership, entrepreneurship, and women in business on Pamela Thompson's The Art of Change. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.